My name's Robert, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm ready to drive. Are we going or are we not? Is it illegal to be this up right now? Because that's a copy on the song. Needless to say, this video will not be like one of my normal true crime videos, and I started it the way I did because I wanted to make that clear. I've been wanting to recreate this video for some time, but I continually put it off for various reasons, but now's the time to sit down, retell my story, in hopes that it can help one person out there. I will be speaking more freely in this video and most likely using explicit language, so I'm sorry if I offend anybody. With that said, this is the dark side of my life. I was born in Denver, Colorado, but very early on in my life, I moved to a small town called Chimicum in Washington State, where there's not a lot of people or things to do. I grew up with two older brothers, and for the most part, I had a normal childhood. I went to school, I had friends, I played sports, I was raised by a single mother, and I didn't really know my dad throughout my life. My father would call me maybe once or twice a year up until I was like seven or eight, and then after that, I never really heard from him. He was also a severe alcoholic who struggled with addiction throughout his life. I was pretty much just your average kid growing up, maybe a little bit chubbier than the rest of them, and I stayed out of trouble for the most part. It wasn't until middle school, when I was roughly 11 to 12 years old, when I started smoking weed for the first time. After that first time smoking, I would smoke more and more and more as I got older, but I didn't start trying drugs and other alcohol until later in high school. Because I know for a fact that I didn't really like being drunk or drinking alcohol until high school. I remember getting drunk one time in middle school off my mother's tequila, and I didn't like it. I just felt weird. Throughout school, I was really antisocial, so when I was in high school and there was parties where my friends would be drinking, I didn't really want to go. I would go to maybe a few parties, but I didn't go to more than five. And I remember being at one of those parties and drinking too much beer and having to run outside to throw up. And after that, I was like, I don't like this. Whether that was because I got too drunk or I drank too much beer and started throwing it up, but I know that freshman year and early in high school, I didn't like drinking. Going through high school, I failed a few classes my freshman year, but other than that, I stayed on top of my things and I graduated with a decent GPA. My senior year of high school, I was working really hard throughout the summer to get prepared for the next basketball season, and me and my friend were so excited about playing together. Then a few practices before our first game of the season, I ended up tearing my ACL and my MCL completely, and I could no longer play. I had to watch him play that entire season without me and it killed me. I remember getting home from the hospital and he pulled up to my house and I looked out the window and I just started crying because I had to tell him that he had to play alone. After getting the surgery and being on bed rest for a month or so, the depression really started to kick in and I had never really dealt with depression before so I didn't know what I was doing. I remember sitting on my bed after the surgery not being able to move and I had all these pain pills that would take the pain away but I just didn't want them. I wanted to drink. And drinking is what I started to do around this time. One thing I noticed with hindsight about those times was when I was drinking alcohol, it would take away the pain of not being able to play. But when I took the pills, it would just take the pain away from my leg. And I didn't really care about the pain in my leg. What hurt more was not being able to play with my best friend. And I ended up going to every single one of those games just to film him and create a highlight video for him. However, I was drunk at the majority of those games because I just didn't want to deal with it. The rest of my senior year is kind of a blur to be honest with you. There was times where I was still on crutches in class in the morning already drunk. I was stumbling around and my friends knew it and if I didn't have alcohol to get drunk and go to school I would eat like eight weed cookies and then just show up blitzed out of my mind. I never did get in trouble for getting drunk at school or getting too high but that doesn't mean that I'm proud of it. Regardless I did end up finishing high school with a decent GPA and I started my life. I got my first job at a Papa Murphy's after high school and I kept it together for quite some time. 
It wasn't long after I got the job at Papa Murphy's that I somehow found a way to start drinking at work, and I would bring alcohol into the freezer and then just drink it and go make some pizza. Not long after starting to work there, maybe two years later, I would move to Verizon, and that's when things took a turn for me. By the time I started working at Verizon, when I was roughly 20 to 21 years old, I was already bringing a water bottle full of vodka into work every single day. And this is after I woke up at 5 in the morning to drink half a fifth of Prestige just to make it to work without shaking. My addiction progressed so quick that I never really even saw it coming. It feels like early in my life, no one had ever explained to me what alcoholism is or what addiction is. So when I was dealing with it firsthand, I had no idea what was going on. It's like I truly lost myself quicker than I ever could have anticipated, and by the time I was 21, I was a full-blown alcoholic. A big reason for not being able to sit with myself was I put lust over love, I cheated, I lied, and I stealed, and I hate hurting the people that I love. So when I do all these nasty things and it makes these people feel some type of way, I just don't want to deal with it, and I started to drink and drink and drink. And by the time I was 21, I was already throwing up blood and drinking two-fifths of Prestige a day. I would wake up at roughly 5 or 6 in the morning and drink half a fifth of Prestige, which is gut rot liquor and will kill you, and then I would go to work, I'd pour the rest of that fifth into a water bottle, and then I'd head off to work. And then by 12 o'clock, I'd be out of alcohol and I'd go get more from the store. And then by the end of the day, I'd be like two fists deep. Drinking those two fifths of Prestige per day while not eating any food really took a toll on my body and just things were going really wrong for me. That same year, I think one of my cars got repoed, and then my manager of Verizon walks into the office and grabs the water bottle. <laughs> she walks, <laughs> grabbed my water bottle, and walked it back out to me and said, "You need to leave." I was, I was just like, you know what? I'm done. I have to. I, I I quit. In hindsight, I think maybe losing my car and my job in the same month. <laughs> I think within a week after losing my job, I remember sitting at my mom's house with my girlfriend at the time and we were watching Intervention and I was drinking and eventually I had to go outside and I started throwing up blood. And at the very end of the show, that number pops up where, you know, if you need help, make this call. And I called that number and they were like, you know what, we can put you on a plane to California to treatment tonight. And I'm like, that gave me three days and I was terrified but eventually I agreed to it and I knew that I needed to make that flight because I couldn't do it here and I needed help I felt like I was dying When I first showed up there and I got out of the van and there's just this sea of people sitting on a patio smoking cigarettes, I had no f clue what I just got myself into and I knew I wanted to go home <laughs> immediately. <laughs> However, treatment the first time was kind of a joke. You know, I was 21, 22, and I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't even have a full grasp of alcoholism and what addiction could do to somebody. So of course I was kind of cocky and confident, like I don't really need all this, this 90 days, that all I need is 32 when I'm out of here. The only thing I knew for sure is that I needed to quit drinking because it was killing me and hurting the people I loved and I hated that. But I remember my first counselor in treatment looking at me and saying, I guarantee you, you will be drunk within a month after getting home. And I remember looking at her just going like, what the f like, how are you going to say that to me? And you don't even know me. Turns out she was right. I stayed for approximately 32 days my first time in treatment. And then I flew home and right away I was smoking weed and within a week I was drinking. The first time I came home from treatment was probably the longest period of time I spent home before returning to treatment again. The very first time I returned home from treatment, I believe it took me a little bit longer to fully revert back into my old ways. I was drinking again, but it wasn't two fists every single day right off the bat. I know after my first stay in treatment and almost every other stay in treatment, I went back to working at Papa Murphy's and there's a reason. It's because I could drink there. I was good at what I did, I made pizza well, I knew the customers, and I could always get away with just drinking and being as drunk as I wanted to be. Eventually I moved out with my girlfriend at the time and we had our son in 2017 and I was still in a really bad place when this was going on. I wasn't sober, I was drunk, I was dirty when I held my son, and I could tell that I just wasn't okay. At the hospital, while she was having our son, whenever we had downtime, I would run down to the car, take a drink of my four loco, and then run back up. That's how f 
fucked up I was. If I was at work, I was drinking. If I was having my son, I was drinking. If I was awake, I was drinking. There was nothing that was going to stop me from drinking. A couple months after we had our son, our differences led us to separating for the time being. And this is when I lost my sh it's like when we left that apartment and I lost her and my son at the same time, I didn't really have any structure or anything to come home to and I went off the rails. I've always done drugs, but I started to do drugs, harder drugs, a lot more while I was drinking. I started going to parties and hanging out with people that I normally wouldn't hang out with. It got me into a lot of trouble and I ended up doing things that I hated myself for for a long time. So after getting home from my first day in treatment, it might have taken me a while, but eventually I was back to drinking a fifth or two a day and I was really sick again. I got to a point where I was drinking so often without eating any food that I started having these liver spots show up on my chest and around my body. So after getting back to that level of drinking and being incredibly sick and not eating, I eventually ended up making that call once more to go back to California to stop drinking. This time when I ended up in California, I had no intentions of actually getting clean, I guess, because I only ended up staying approximately 14 days. After that 14 days, I believe that was the trip where I went to the airport and before I even made it back to Seattle, I had a drink at the airport. So I was already f***ed. Going home was bound to be a massacre again because I was just gonna lose everything I have and hurt the people I love. That's all I do when I'm drinking. And I know that it got bad extremely fast that second time I came home because it didn't even take two months for me to make another call to go back to California because I needed a detox. <laughs> you blame this on me. You tried to walk in a straight line and now you're fucking on your ass in the bushes. Hold on, don't try and push me. Yo, bro, this is gonna be a lot of weight. Alright, you good, you good, you good. Your hat's still over there, man. It's like when I got home and I started drinking, I would start drinking so much, so fast, and so regularly that if I stopped drinking by myself, I was liable to die. Because I remember there was times I would sit in my room and I was begging myself not to drink, please don't do it. And then within 30 minutes to an hour, my heart was racing so fast and I was so shaking that I just couldn't help it, I had to do it. If you guys want me to give you the purest example of how desperate I was and how shaky I would get, there was a time I was looking for liquor i didn't have any money at the time so i started walking around the house looking for rubbing alcohol because i knew it had alcohol in it but i didn't find any what i did find was dog ear cleaner and that dog ear cleaner was expired i picked it up it said something something acid something something acid alcohol i took it i poured it into a cup grabbed it and slammed it back then i took my handful of pennies and started walking to the store to buy some beer and that entire walk i burped up this dog ear cleaner that i could taste and I drank it just because it said it had alcohol in it. It's unbelievable when I look back at it. And to be clear, throughout 2017, 18, and 19, I ended up in treatment approximately four times. So it's kind of blurry exactly when those times were, except for the final two. In 2018, I did end up getting a DUI, and I spent about a week in jail. Shortly after getting out of jail and back into my routines, it wasn't long before I started throwing up blood again, and the entire time, I would also be bleeding while I was using the bathroom. These things would happen to me for years on end while I was drinking, and I would just ignore them. It just felt like every time I came home, it was only a matter of time before I caused devastation and hurt the ones I love, and I was killing myself to do it. It's like I knew I wanted to do the right thing for my girl and my son, I just didn't know how at the time. At some point, while I was running the streets, drinking and doing drugs, my doctor started to call my mom and email me and send me letters talking about my labs and how sick I really was. And I remember I went to lunch with my mom and she walks in with a piece of paper and she sits down with it and she's basically already crying. And she says, Robert, you're a sick puppy. And she flips this paper around for me and it's just my labs and the numbers are all f up. I was incredibly sick, my enzymes were through the roof, my eyes were all yellow, and I had these liver spots all over my body. I just remember the fear in her eyes and the fact that she was already almost crying and I just felt like and at that moment I knew like this is real. 
This is serious. This doctor is telling me, look, you're gonna die. And knowing that I didn't have much of an option because I couldn't just stop drinking alone, I knew I had to go back to California for my fourth stay in treatment. This time when I went to California, I ended up actually getting kicked off the plane the first flight because I was too drunk, so I stayed in Seattle, and then the next flight, I got on it, and the plane takes off, and then the stewardess come around, you know, asking if people want drinks, and I asked them for a shooter, and they told me, look, you're too intoxicated, sir, we can't serve you. And I was like, what? That's bullshit. Give me, give me my drink, you know, I'm going to treatment, I just need to get the edge off. She's like, you need to go talk to the head stewardess if you really feel that way. So I did, I was like, alright, I'm going to talk to her because I want my drink. So I go talk to her and she's like, look sir, if that's what they said, you're too intoxicated and we can't serve you. So I said to her, I said, fine, that's fine. If somebody dies on this plane, that's on you. I was talking about myself withdrawing from alcohol, but they didn't take it that way and they got the LAPD waiting for me at LAX. I walk off the plane, they're like, Robert? I'm like, shit. And then they, they detain me for a while. They call my mom. They're like, he's threatening people on the plane. I'm like, no, I was talking about myself. It was a shit show. Anyway, I land in LAX and then you go to medical clearance before you can ever go to treatment because they need to make sure you're medically cleared. And this time when I got to the hospital, they immediately admitted me because I had acute pancreatitis and I ended up staying in the ICU for about a week before I even made it to treatment that time. And that entire week, I do not remember a single thing because they were pumping Ativan into my IV almost consistently. I remember getting picked up and that's about it. Then I was taken to treatment and I stayed in treatment this time for about four months. And I think a lot of that was out of fear because I didn't want to go home and up. I didn't want to hurt anybody and I didn't want to die. So I stayed put for four months. However, I didn't do any work on myself or the things that were causing me to drink. I never opened up an AA book or even tried the steps. So without any working on myself or any book work or knowledge on how to tackle this disease, I went home after four months and it didn't end well. I came back to Washington and almost right away I went back to the devil's playground. I got my job back at Papa Murphy's and I know for a fact that I went and got liquor on the very first day that I started working because that's what I knew. So right away I had to know that I was f***ed but I just didn't acknowledge it and I started going back to work and acting like I wasn't going to get sick again. So I just started working and drinking again and it seems that when I'm working there is when I was drinking the most. It doesn't make any sense but that's just what I did. And mind you, every single time I would come home and relapse, the time it took to get back into full blown addiction would always get shorter and shorter. I eventually became manager and the very first week of being a manager is the week that I left. I was at home one night after getting off of work and I was drinking all day of course and during these times I do not eat food when I am drinking that heavily and this night I decided decided to try to eat something. I remember trying to eat some spaghetti or something. And I remember the second that food hit my pancreas, it was immediately hell. I started crying and throwing up blood and it was the worst pain I think I had ever felt. And I told my mom, look, you have to take me to the ER room now. We eventually made it to the hospital when they did some tests and they told me my enzymes were in the 23,000s, which is incredibly high. And they admitted me into the ICU once again with acute pancreatitis. This time in the ICU wasn't as much of a blur for me because they weren't giving me Ativan, they were giving me Dilaudid. Anyways, I was in the ICU for approximately five to six days, all the while I'm supposed to be managing this store, but I'm not because I was drinking too much, that I ended myself up in the ICU. So after about five or six days in the ICU, I decided I was done with it. And I told the nurse, like, I'm done. I need to AMA because I'm leaving. She's like, are you crazy? You can't do that. I'm like, yep, I need to do it. I AMA'd and I went straight to the gas station and bought myself a six pack. And my thought process behind that at the time was I'm not going to drink hard alcohol because that's going to be harder on my pancreas. I'll take it easy and drink some beer. That's insane. So I remember getting home and then drinking about two beers before I went to sleep. Then I woke up the next morning and it was right back to the same sh drinking hard alcohol even though I was super sick and I knew that I couldn't continue to do this. I then made the decision to go back to California for a fifth time and this time when I left I didn't leave on good terms. I just walked away from the store and I never planned to go back and work there. I also knew how sick I was and I knew the dangers of going back to work there. It's just something I didn't want to do and when I say I just walked away from that store I basically just walked. After making that decision for the fifth time and calling the Discovery House and getting my trip booked, I knew that something needed to change. So I went and got a half gallon and put it into a McDonald's cup and I headed to the airport. 
This time when I arrived in California, I was kind of scared, and that's because the staff members had never looked at me the way they looked at me this time. There was a fear in their eyes that I had just never seen when they were looking at me, and that scared me. This time in detox, I knew I was tired of the empty promises, I was tired of failing myself and my family, and I knew that something needed to change, otherwise I was I had left California four times and every single time I tried it my way, I messed it up and I messed it up quick. So I knew that if I tried it my way, it wasn't going to work. So before the 30 days at residential were even up, we went to a meeting one night and I saw a man named Don who was going through a divorce and he was sober and happy. And I knew that was something that I couldn't personally do. So I asked him, hey man, I don't know how you're doing that, but I'd love for you to show me the way and show me how to be okay sober. That was probably the first time I had openly asked for help and willingly took the help that he was going to give me. So when he told me to open the book and read this page, I did it. And when he told me to call him at this time, I did it. Having a sponsor was something that really helped open my eyes to the way I was thinking about things and treating my situation back home. As I mentioned, I knew something needed to change. So when he started walking me through the book and the steps, I had to take a step back and take my ego out of it and really just honestly, openly, and willingly listen to him. Not only that, I had to be honest about who I was, what I was doing, and how I was hurting people. The fourth step was probably the most eye-opening thing I've ever done, but there's a good chance it saved my life. And even though I have never finished all 12 steps, that's a big goal I have because I know how much just five have done for me. This final trip to California, I ended up staying there for approximately nine months before I came home. I can easily say a big reason I stayed in California for so long that time was just fear. I didn't want to go home and drink. I didn't want to go home and hurt people. I didn't want to f up. So I just stayed put. And during this trip, I ended up getting on Seroquel, which I started at a small dose of 25 milligrams just to help me sleep. However, for no reason at all, I started talking to the doctor and got him to up my dose to 50 milligrams, then to 100, then to 200, and eventually I was at 600 milligrams of Seroquel. And that will ruin anybody that it's not prescribed to. Yes, it was prescribed to me, but I also talked my way into that dose and I do not need that drug. The amount of food I would eat on a daily basis is absolutely astonishing, and the way I would do it is actually sickening. Every single night in treatment when it hit medtime bedtime, I would take my 600 milligrams of Seroquel, I would go to the kitchen, make whatever food I wanted to make, and then every single night I'd also get a big bowl of ice cream, put cookies in it, and then take it back to my bedroom, sit on my bed and eat it. And after I would eat it, I would go straight to bed, and then within 30 minutes every single night after going to bed, I would wake up choking because I had thrown some of that food up while I was sleeping. Living that way is the reason I got to 350 pounds because I was eating so many calories right before I would go to sleep to the point where I would throw them up in my mouth and wake up almost dying. Not only was I overweight and feeling like shit, it really felt like I was losing myself. Like I didn't know who I was, but I knew at some point I was going to have to face those fears and go home and be successful without drinking and up because I have a son. Around the end of my nine months in California is around the time COVID hit and it was then when I decided, you know what, if I'm going to go home, I can do it now and I'm going to do it successfully. And I knew that when I went home, I was going to have to stay in touch with the people in California because I had gone home four times before and every single time I it up almost immediately. Now when I came home, I didn't drink and I did stay in contact with my support for about two to three weeks, but I was also just miserable. I was still 350 pounds, I was still taking 600 milligrams of Seroquel and eating myself to death. When I say Seroquel is a really really heavy drug, especially at that dose, I mean it. It's really hard for me to remember exactly what was going on during that time period in my life. I stayed at home doing basically nothing for approximately a year, just surviving on six 600 milligrams of Seroquel, I was 350 pounds, and I was so depressed. Eventually, about a year after getting home, I made the dumb decision to pop a bunch of gabapentin because I was going to one of my son's birthday parties, and I had a lot of anxiety about it. I was just overweight, and I was so so uncomfortable being myself. It's actually a really weird memory for me because I took all of the pills, the gabapentin, the night before, and then the next morning when I woke up, I felt so strange. Within about 45 minutes of waking up that next morning, I started to black out and fall to the ground. I ended up having a really bad seizure, I fell on my face, split my tongue open, blacked out, and then I woke up in the hospital. I remember waking up and feeling so ashamed by what had just taken place, and I knew that something had to give because I couldn't live 
live like this. It was so embarrassing laying in that hospital bed, knowing that I f***ed up once more, going home with my face and tongue all f***ed up because I couldn't just sit there and be myself around people that I genuinely loved. So in a sense, I'm really grateful that that overdose did happen, otherwise I never would have woke up to what was going on. And after that overdose, I went to my doctor and I told him, look, I'm obviously not myself and I need to try coming off of all these drugs. So after talking to my doctor, I eventually went from 600 milligrams of Seroquel down to 300 milligrams of Seroquel. And I was able to find a little bit of mental clarity and start this channel and make some goals to stick to. I I started to get my health back and I dropped maybe 100 pounds and honestly it's kind of crazy we've even made it this far when you look at the quality of my old content. 10-15 people but it felt like this fucking sea of people that just started staring at me. And after about a year of being on 300 milligrams and just working on myself and things I wanted to do, I made the decision to come down to zero milligrams of Seroquel. And that's when I got all of my mental clarity back because that drug is not for me. It wasn't prescribed to me. I just talked my way into it in treatment, which is something that a lot of people end up doing. And that's scary because an addict like me will talk their way into the highest dose for absolutely no reason at all and become a zombie for years. After getting off of Seroquel completely, I started to do really well. I started to run, I started to work out, and I really found myself again. However, normally when I start to feel good is normally when I start to make bad decisions. At some point in 2023, after I had lost my aunt and it was just a really rough time for everybody, I was struggling to deal with my emotions about the situation while also being there for other people. And then one day while I was at the smoke shop, I made the dumb decision that I'm going to get more than just nicotine and I'm going to get some of that kratom over there because I just want to take the edge off. So that's what I did. I bought some kratom and some nicotine. I took it home and I popped about five grams of this kratom and I remember feeling like okay this is pretty similar to opiates which opiates I can kick without medical help. That's the way I was thinking because I was already justifying in my head that I can take more of this stuff. However as an addict I will gravitate towards anything that will alter my mind state. So when it made me feel a little bit better and I got a little buzz I almost immediately went back to it which started this vicious cycle of taking kratom for approximately two months until I was addicted to it and then I would force myself to withdraw from it for a week just so I knew that I could do it and then I'd go right back to it for like two months and once I get myself into those situations it becomes really hard for me to open up to the people I love and my support. I just would rather deal with it alone and suffer in silence because I don't want to let them down. So I just tried to stay focused on what I needed to do while also knowing that I needed to stop taking this immediately because with my nerve damage it was causing some really weird reactions. There was times I would try to record after a day of taking Kratom and that would have me twitching on camera because of the Kratom, my nerve damage, and duloxetine. I'll try to find an example of me twitching on camera while I'm just trying to sit there and these movements are not voluntary. I am not meaning to do this and that's sad. In my mind, it was okay that I was taking Kratom because I wasn't drunk, I wasn't running around hurting people like I used to, and it was something that I could get off by myself. But in reality, I was hurting myself and everybody I love because I drew into myself and I started to push people away. I eventually hit a breaking point in February of 2024 and I said I'm done with this sh I'm done letting myself down. I feel like I let you guys down over this last year just with my personal struggles and putting my emotions over my work. And as almost a 30 year old man, letting my emotions dictate what I do throughout the day is pathetic. So it's obvious that I haven't been clean and sober for the past five years. I just haven't drank alcohol for almost five years. Am I ashamed by that? Yeah, but it's also just part of my story and I understand that. Since I quit messing with it, I've felt so much better, I'm taking care of myself again, I'm working out, and I'm in better shape than I've ever been. And it's just like, why did I put myself in that situation when I knew the outcome? So now on this journey, it just feels like I'm reinventing myself again as a man, and this has to be the very last time I do this, and it has to stick for me and my son, because I know he's looking up to me, and I cannot let him down. I know what your father giving up and not being in your life does to you, and I will not do that to him. That's a promise. I know that when I wake up in the morning, I'm still the problem and the way I think is dangerous and I have to be aware of that. The only thing that I need to do for myself is try to be better than I was yesterday and do that every single day for the rest of my life. Because if I don't, I just take steps backwards and I'm so tired of taking steps forwards just to let myself fall back into the same patterns. I can easily say that right now I'm in the best place mentally that I have been in the past year and this past year has really just been a weird time for me. It genuinely feels like I only have one chance to get this right. One chance to be a good father, a good man, and not f 
this up again. I just want you guys to know that if I can do it, I believe you can do it too. And if you're anything like me, doing it without support is not the way to go and I would never recommend it. And sometimes there's things I do on a day-to-day -day basis that are not making me happy and I need to stop those things. For me, it really feels like it's now or never and you guys will see me acting accordingly. If you or anyone you know is struggling with addiction, please reach out. You are not alone and there is help out there. It's important to remember that people can change and you can be a better version of yourself. You don't have to continue living the way you do. There is a better way to life without drugs and alcohol. And even though I haven't been leading that life, I know it's out there and I will go get it. Be patient with yourselves and take it easy. Life is full of mistakes. We really just have to learn from them. I love you guys and I'll see you really soon for the next true crime video. Peace. Let's take a walk until the sun gets warm. Time